and you're late. What? You're late. Marty Scorsese's biopic, The Irishman, is one of 2019's best. It's the perfect send-off to a generation of cast and crew that immersed themselves in the gangster culture for decades, and the work they produced will stand for all of eternity. Scorsese's latest endeavor has several standout subjects that make up its DNA. The first of these items is cars and the word Detroit. Vehicles in the Irishman exemplify many important things. Cars, according to Tony Crisp, symbolize meetings and partings. Our first scene, chronologically speaking, is Frank driving a truck for a meat company across Pennsylvania. The truck breaks down and Frank goes to a gas station to try and fix it. Frank meets Russell Buffalino without knowing it, and Russell fixes the truck because he used to be a mechanic for Canada Dry. There was something wrong with the engine, which is the heart of every automobile, and Russell ends up fixing the problem and helping Frank at no cost to him. Russell will end up helping Frank the rest of his life, for better. You got a good friend here. You don't know how good a friend you got. Well, I, I know. No, you don't know. And for worse. Don't call. Cars can be very dangerous, not just on the road, but as a representation of our attitudes and relationships. It's not so much the importance of vehicles that Scorsese is stressing, but the destinations. The second plotline of the film is Frank driving Russell and their wives to Detroit for a wedding of Russell's cousin. The city, Detroit, is repeated more times than any other town in the film. Detroit. To Detroit. To Detroit. 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 McGee's in Detroit. And why is that? Detroit's most notorious nickname is the Motor City. They were the birthplace of the first mass-produced vehicle in the early 1900s via the Ford Motor Company. But why is this place so important in the film? Frank and the whole mob is from Philly. Why is Bill's daughter getting married in Detroit? Because the destination was more than just a ceremony. The wedding was a cover for Russell having Frank do a hit on Jimmy, a major turning point for Frank and his family. Cars represent personal choice and freedom according to Crisp. They are representative of ability to move around or power to direct our life, to achieve results, and to make choices. Only Frank made the wrong choices for a very, very long time. Cars drive you in life, but what drives Frank? What motivates him? Frank's first words to the audience is him telling his life story and how he was a bum until he wasn't one. One of a thousand working stiffs. Until I wasn't no more. He viewed his later mob missions as extra cash. I was just doing a job to make some extra money. And he needed the riches with the excuse of providing for his family. Only thing is... You got more kids, you got to earn more, more money. Wasn't being a union man and getting more personal revenue the whole point of the union in the first place? How's it going with the union? The union's the best in the world. You like it, huh? Yeah, no, it's just, I mean, I wish I had something more steady, but yeah, it's... it's... Or did Frank have other ambitions? Ambitions to be somebody? So driving a union truck wasn't as well-paying as he thought. So Frank made more money stealing steak for Skinny Razor, a local mafioso, in which he got caught, but didn't rat anyone out. Frank's lawyer from the union, Bill Buffalino, was related to Russell Buffalino, the man he met earlier on the road to Detroit. Scorsese indicates here that meetings are crucial to one's life and says what you've done or where you came from can get you in the door even further. I heard you paint houses. Yes, yes, sir, I, I do, I do, and I, uh, I also do my own carpentry. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. I understand you're a brother of mine. Yes, sir, Local 107, since 1947. Yeah, you know, uh, our friend speaks very highly of you. The whole I Paint Houses spiel is a twofold mirage. One, it represents to the mob that he's a hitman. To metaphorically paint a house is to paint the walls of a house with someone's blood. 
Secondly, to literally paint a house is to objectively redecorate. So what kind of image does Frank Sheeran want to paint of himself to the world? That he's just a simple man doing his job? You can moonshine a lot of people, but there's a certain few you cannot moonshine. And one of those people is Jimmy Hoffa. Jimmy was notorious for being an authoritarian. And you're late. What? You're late. Hoffa has a code that's repeated just like Detroit is, in which Hoffa doesn't wait more than... In 10 minutes. In 10 minutes. ...for a meeting. The man respects punctuality. This code should have saved Jimmy's life, considering in the climax he should have left after waiting more than 10 minutes for Frank and the gang, but Jimmy went against his motto, something he never did when it came to insulting people and making something out of nothing in most instances. Yeah, more than 10 is saying something. He's saying something to me. No, I'm here. Hmm. It says what it says. Frank had lived a parallel life to Jimmy. Sheeran thought that the world was so evil, he had to do evil things back in order to protect his family. I was just trying to, to protect her, protect all of us. I mean, that's what I was doing. That's from what? From everything. You you, you just had a, a a sheltered life in a way because you didn't see what I see, what I've been through. And I, there are not a lot of bad people out there. What else am I going to do? <laughs> Frank was delusional. He didn't have to job to the mob. He was oblivious to the damage caused to his loved ones, but that was his own world, the mob's world, and it was clear his daughters didn't want a part of it. But Jimmy, Jimmy loved his world. He loved it so much, it was his downfall because he was proud of everything that he's done. I'll apologize for it. That's all I want. After you apologize for being late, you motherfucking wop sucker. <laughs> After newly appointed Attorney General Bobby Kennedy tried throwing the book at Jimmy, Jimmy made it his personal vendetta to disrespect the Kennedys, not only in private, but in public as well. Son of a bitch. Hoffa made his staffers re-raise the flag from half-staff to full-staff after JFK's assassination. He didn't like the Kennedys because they were rich kids whose dad had mob ties. The mob got one of the kids elected as president and returned to get Havana and the casinos back from Castro. It's ironic for Jimmy because, for a while, Hoffa did business with the mob, giving them loans from his own union pension fund. It was the Teamsters that stepped in and lent the money that built Las Vegas. Jimmy also did some racketeering and other non-saintly crimes to make sure he doesn't lose out on his position of power in the union. He ends up going to the pen thanks to Big Eddie going undercover, watching Hoffa dig up dirt on enemies, and eventually gets him on committing fraud. I gotta talk to him on a problem I got with my pension. But out of all the gangsters in the story, Jimmy is different than all of them because he has a good moral grounding to his character. Pro comes to Hoffa about his $1.2 million pension and how he lost it in the joint on his seven-year sentence for extortion charges. Pro finds out that Hoffa's $1.5 million pension is still okay, even though he's in prison with him as well. Pro finds out about this disparity, not just between himself and Hoffa, but between Hoffa and the rest of the gangsters. And what's the difference? I didn't threaten anybody. You did. In fact, Jimmy draws a line from the get-go in the sand about the mob. And as the story progresses, he'll only get more and more morally right. I mean, you know, you threaten people once in a while. Okay, I understand. But all the time. When he appoints Fitz as his right-hand man, but then gets thrown in the slammer, Fitz does more deals with the mob that infuriates Jimmy. When Jimmy gets released from the can, he goes after Fitz for this, on the record, in public, saying that the mob has their hand in the union. The mob, represented by Tony Pro's boss, Tony Salerno, says Jimmy should retire, cash out his pension, and spend time with his grandkids, to which Jimmy says no. Go no further, Frank. Jimmy doesn't like Tony Pro from the get-go. Pro, the local 560 president, had Sally Bugs whack Tony three fingers, Tony Pro's own guy, because he was coming up big in the union and could possibly beat him out, and then had his body thrown in a wood chipper. So after Pro and Jimmy are released from the slammer, Pro endorses Fitz as union president. If Pro endorses Hoffa instead, 
Hoffa has an easier chance of getting his union back. In an attempt to get said endorsement, Hoffa feels disrespected because of Pro's tardiness and dress code and lets his pride get to him. He doesn't apologize for disrespecting Pro whilst both of them were locked up at the same time. That's what you said, right, Jim? You people. Well, am I beneath you? Definitely. Jimmy, Jimmy what are you come doing? on. Whilst Jimmy, being corrupt in some ways, fought hard for the working people, and Frank's daughter Peggy noticed his moral compass right away and took a liking to Jimmy. And also to her, he was helping people. He was helping to make more money, live better lives. He wasn't stopping on somebody's hand. She did many activities with him and boasted about his greatness to her class in a presentation. He's the president of the Teamsters Union with over a million members. They all support him because they have steady jobs, great pay, and a pension for when they retire. She saw something in him that she didn't see in Russell. Hey, Peggy. Come over here. I don't know. I don't know. I get the feeling she don't like me like she's afraid of me. And she never ended up taking a liking to Russell. He gets Peggy skates for Christmas, and she doesn't even appear to be that joyful. I heard you like to skate. What do you say? Thank you. In fact, Peggy didn't like any mobsters from the beginning as she eyed them up during Dolores' baptism, and probably didn't like the fact that Russell helped baptize her younger sister. But the biggest gangster of all that she did not like was her own dad. She's afraid of me at times, too, so it's just a, she's a sensitive kid. That, that's all it is. I can understand her being afraid of me, but she shouldn't be scared of you, Frank. No, and then she hears about being a paper somehow. Something really? Here, and, yeah. It started with Frank's first violent act in the story, beating up Jim, the grocer, for shoving Peggy at the store for being out of line. He gets the truth out of his daughter. Just answer me. Did he push you? Did he shove you? Whatever it is, did he do that? Let's go. Then takes Peggy to the store and proceeds to violently assault the grocer until he's incapacitated. Something worth noting that solidifies the preceding theory is the timing of church bells going off in the background and Frank hitting Joe in the face. It's at the exact same time. Peggy then watches her dad beat up Joe as the church bells continue to ring. This is the first time Peggy is disappointed in her father. Every time from here on out, when Frank goes out to do a job for the mob, Peggy is watching. If he's going out to bum a Jewish laundromat, or returns from a job like when he murdered Whispers or Gallows, Peggy is staring at him, judging him. Considering Frank and his family are Catholic and Christian symbols and dialect arise throughout the film, like the number of days it takes for Frank's trip to Detroit. It was going to take about three days with all the business breaks and cigarette stops. Lines up with Christian theology considering the similar amount of days from Jesus' death to resurrection. Frank has a choice at the end of that trip to resurrect his conscience and soul, in which he does not. Or the symbol of the fish, which is notoriously a Christian image seen everywhere. Yeah, I had a frozen fish I had to deliver for a friend of mine. I cleaned it up, Jimmy. It's all right. You cleaned it up? You ever caught a fucking fish in your life? No. Well, then you don't know. Never put a fish in your car. You never get the smell out. You no. Unless you pack it tight, you know? No, I, I know. Remember that. It'll help you in life. Peggy can be seen as a metaphor for the Holy Spirit, which is present inside all of us. She is judging how unchristian Frank's actions are, and she is present every time. Where are you going? I'm going to work. Go back to sleep. The Christian way would be to not assault our enemy physically to the point of death, but to go to the police and figure things out lawfully or other means of vengeance that does not take God's place. That's why I want you to run for president of Local 326. You're like family to me, Frank, you know. That is why her face lights up with Jimmy, a corrupt but better soul than the gangster Russell, and her father. She prefers Jimmy, and what her father did to Jimmy was unforgivable. I love you. I just love you, you know. 
Jimmy's demise wasn't just because of his pride, but having the wrong friends did him in, just like Frank. That's what makes the climax so tragic yet beautifully orchestrated in its storytelling. They, once again, both mirrored each other. They are on a collision course, thanks to the mob. Since Jimmy can't get back into being president because Pro won't endorse him, and the mob won't whack Pro for Jimmy, Jimmy, to get back at the mob, has old friends in the union that will block the mob's loans from the union's pension fund. And if Jimmy gets back into office as president, he's going to stop the loans completely and the mob won't get their cut. I mean, who does he think he is, Castro? When Russell tries to liaison his way into Hoffa's conscience, it fails because Jimmy won't let anyone take away his union that he built himself and will not bow down to anyone, not even the mob. I'm trying to help you, Jim. I know you. But nobody threatens Hoffa. Frank then receives two gifts. The first is a gold watch from the Teamsters and Jimmy. The second is a gold ring from Russell, which only three people in the world have, and Frank's one of them. Russell, after gaining Frank's gratitude, tells Frank that Hoffa is a lost cause. Things have gotten out of hand with our friend again. And some people are having serious problems with him. And uh, it's at a point where you're going to have to talk to him and tell him it's what it is. Frank then relays the message to Jimmy in which Jimmy regurgitates that he's not going to play nice with the pushers. Frank then tells Jimmy the mob could put a hit out on him. Mm, it's what it is. Jimmy laughs it off and doesn't think it's severe. They wouldn't dare. Don't, don't they wouldn't me. dare. Jimmy, please. Jimmy proclaims that he has records and other leverage on the mob that if they kill him, he'll send them out to the press and they'll be done for. They do something to me, I do something to them. That's all I know. I don't know anything else. Do you? Frank seems to be in a pickle as he watches Peggy dance with Jimmy. Peggy, who's already aware of everything going on because she watched Pro and Russell's ears, he sat with Solarno, and saw Russell and Frank atop the balcony both discussing that Jimmy has to sleep with the fishes. It seems she knows what'll happen next. But nothing happens until that trip to Detroit. Jimmy doesn't want to meet with the old boys and hangs up on Frank. Then, presumably, Russell has something done that makes Jimmy change his mind. A person that he likes, Tony Jack, will be there at the meeting, and he's more comfortable with the meeting now. With the, li with the little guy? Yeah. But Frank is trying to be a good friend and look out for his buddy and suggests that he be there for Jimmy. Jimmy, I think I should be there. Oh, yeah, I want you there. That's why I asked when you're coming in. What time's the meeting? 2.30. And he better not be late, that sucker. Or wearing those fucking shorts. Russell then connives the whole ordeal. He uses Frank as a pawn for the mob to gain Jimmy's trust. I had to put you into this thing. Or you would never let it happen. And the worst part is, Frank goes along with it. He'll paint one last house. Even if he doesn't have the foresight to see, it'll ruin his relationship with Peggy. Frank's two biggest possessions aren't his two daughters, unfortunately. It's the mob ring Russell gives him and the gold watch from Jimmy. Frank wore both items until the end. The ring signifies two things. One of them, according to Tony Crisp, is a representation of one's essential self. Everything Frank has done in his new life has built up to receiving that honor. Frank is married yet wears Russell's ring on his left hand ring finger. His friendship and his job is more important than his own marriage. And two, the mob will have Frank running around in circles until they're done with him because it's a commitment as are all ring bands. Russell asks for Frank's sunglasses before leaving to Detroit and Frank gives them to him, a display of ownership. Russell gives them back to Frank later after he executes the hit. The watch will represent the clock ticking. Not on Jimmy's demise from the mob, but on Frank's. Frank has a choice represented by the two gifts given to him at his celebratory dinner. But Frank chooses wrong. The first of those two gifts was Jimmy's, not Russell's. Jimmy saved Frank's butt first by having that union contract covering him when he was fired from his job stealing meat for the mafia. 
Jimmy was helping Frank before Russell was, and the only reason why Frank got in trouble in the first place was because of the mob. Scorsese even has Jimmy drink Canada Dry ginger ale instead of alcohol throughout the film to show that Russell, who originally worked for the Canadian company, serves Jimmy. How am I going to look into it? What am I going to look into? It is what it is. It's what it is. It's what it is. What it is. It's what it is. Frank gets on a plane, a symbolic risk machine, and arrives to Detroit. A plane ride can be life-changing to hop onto one. On his hand is an address written, 83 Caesar Road. Caesar obviously being the notorious leader of Rome who was murdered in a coup by his own people who thought it was for the greater good, foreshadows Jimmy's demise. Jimmy meets Frank outside the Red Fox restaurant and Russell's plan is in the works. Jimmy is lured into the car and sits next to Frank. He asks him if he's got his gun as an insurance policy. Look at your friend. I hear. Good. You never know what this guy's up. We live without Russ there. Jimmy's trust is not bothered. Frank's there. Russ will be there. Everything will be okay. Until it's not. Frank kills Jimmy in cold blood. A completely soulless act. Jimmy waited 40 minutes for Frank at the Red Fox. In casual clothes. Something he vehemently made fun of previously. This sucker shows up at a meet. 15 minutes late. Wearing f***ing shorts. Who wears shorts to a meet? Nobody. That's right. Nobody. Jimmy was loyal to Frank till the end. Let's get out of here, Frank. Come on. The wedding is shown in the preceding scene. According to Tony Crisp, weddings are about uniting two different aspects of yourself. The marriage between conscious and unconscious self. Frank can't go anywhere now. He was on a set path of destruction with no turning back. He was married to the mob. It was like the army. You followed orders. You did the right thing. You got rewarded. But killing as displayed with multiple edits and a montage of him throwing multiple firearms into the water was not the right thing, as Frank calls it. His loyalty to the gangsters rather than the people who truly loved him ruined him. It's no mistake the audience sees a shot of Peggy's concerned face watching the television report as the first image of the disappearance of Jimmy. The television blares the audio, but Scorsese concentrates on Peggy. She's the first thing the audience sees. Frank then arrives, and Peggy is the only one that looks at him. She stares at him and she just knows, the same way God knows everything we do. Frank hasn't made a phone call to Jimmy's wife yet, and Peggy wants to know why. Why what? Why haven't you called Joe? Frank leaves to do the phone call to Jimmy's wife, and Peggy watches him go up the stairs. It's the last time they're in the same house together. Frank lost his daughter. August 3rd, 1975. The story begins to close out with a montage of indictments of every gangster in the film. Pro, Bugs, Chucky, Salerno, and Russell. When Buffalino is caught for conspiracy to kill a witness, Frank is so delusional that he argues to the audience that it was obvious entrapment. Russ goes to the can anyway, as does Frank, who's arrested for blowing up a crane company and accepting bribes. The two spend time together in the pen as very old men and break bread and drink juice. Only this wasn't the first time the two symbolized Christ's Last Supper. Their first dinner together they eat bread and dipped it in wine, as well as later in the story during a different dinner. Every time they ate was a moment of significance for the story, either starting their friendship, changing their own lives, or lamenting over the past. In fact, something interesting to note is that the first time they broke bread together, Frank tells a story about the war. Frank has Germans dig their graves, an allegory for himself digging his own grave by being a part of the mob and painting houses for them. So, if that were the case, and Frank is one of the German soldiers, who is Frank? Well, I mean, maybe they thought if they did a good job, the guy with the gun would change his mind. Frank would be playing God. There is no mistake that this recollection is during the exact same time 
when they have their first symbolic Last Supper together. The bread and wine in the Holy Eucharist for Catholics is not a symbol, but a spiritual taking in of Christ's body and blood, as those who did it during the Last Supper before Jesus' death with the King himself. It helps Catholics to become more holy because Christ is present in the sacraments. Robert Bishop Barron of Los Angeles, His Excellency, says the sacrament is the breakthrough of grace. So Frank and Russell taking in the bread and wine three times is them participating on cleansing their souls with God. When Frank and Russell have one last yeast and drink together, Russell laments over Jimmy's death. And Jimmy was a good man, you know, a nice family too, huh? I never wanted it to go that far. Then Russell goes into church for forgiveness of his sins. I'm going to church. Church? Don't laugh, you'll see. Don't laugh. Frank is surprised. Russell went to church. Then he went to the prison hospital. And, uh, and then he went to the graveyard. But Frank gives it a shot himself. It meaning salvation. Frank was Catholic. He had all of his daughters baptized in the Catholic Church. He had a crucifix on his dresser next to his two prized possessions, but he never hung up the cross, which Catholics usually do in their household. After Russell passes, he goes back to his roots after doing some reflecting on the purpose of life. Sooner or later, everybody put here as a date when he's gonna go. And I think that there's gotta be something when you go because, I mean, how the hell did this whole thing start? So Frank talks to the visiting priest more and more at his senior living complex. He attempts to connect with God again and cites the Hail Mary with the Father. Yeah, it, was, it wasn't too bad. You know. It's been a, been a while. <laughs> Not bad at all. But any attention was there, the attention. I know. Frank continues in his conversation about burial options and says out of all of them, he chooses a mausoleum. That's why I would never go for cremation, because it's so, it's so final. Why is he so worried about finality? He's worried about not being forgiven by God. It has to be a metal casket, and they have you in the room, and all that there. It's just not as final. This stirs up the final point. Will Frank get into heaven? There's a controversial doctrine floating around the Catholic community the past decade known as the Dare We Hope thesis. The 19th century Catholic priest and Swiss theologian Hans Ernst von Balthasar argued in his 1988 book Dare We Hope That All Men Be Saved that hell is possibly empty and men who want to be saved are saved by the grace of God because it's incompatible with the idea that God is love and would send them to eternal damnation. Bishop Robert Barron, His Excellency, says the Catholic Church has no official stance if there is anyone in hell and defends Balthazar, saying the only way to truly be in hell is to reject God and his divine love in the very end. If there are any human beings in hell, there are because they absolutely insist on it. The conditional clause with which the last sentence began honors the Church's conviction that, though we must accept the possibility of hell due to the play between divine love and human freedom, we're not committed doctrinally to say that anyone is actually in such a place. We can't fully see the depths of anyone's heart, only God can. Accordingly, we can't declare with uttered certitude that anyone, even Judas, even Hitler, has chosen definitively to lock the door against the divine love. Indeed, the liturgy compels us to pray for all the dead, since the law of prayer is the law of belief, we must hold out at least the hope that all people will be saved. Furthermore, since Christ went to the very limits of God-forsakenness in order to establish solidarity, even with those who are furthest from grace, we may, as Hans Ernst von Balthasar insisted, reasonably hope that all will find salvation. In fact, it is God's desire for his people to receive salvation as St. Paul wrote to Timothy, God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all. Dr. Ralph Martin of Detroit argues against this universalist position in his 1988 book, Will Many Be Saved? Arguing from the teachings of Jesus. Yeah, it's just the opposite of what Jesus says. You know, what does Jesus say? Matthew chapter 7. 
broad and wide is the way that leads to destruction. Many are traveling that way. Narrow is the door that leads to life. Hard, hard is the road and few there are who are finding it. Now, he uses an example of St. Faustina. And he warns her, he says, you know, I tell people about my mercy because they'll perish if they don't respond to my mercy. You know, mm. many, many times in, in the revelations of St. Faustina, he says, people need to respond to my mercy, and they're perishing because they're not responding. Martin argues if hell is empty, why bother with holiness, evangelism, vocations? Let's all just golf on Sundays. All will be forgiven. Everyone would be like Zac Efron's character Flicker in The Beach Bum, thinking doing wrong is okay. Because the best part is we can do whatever the f we want. Jesus already paid for all our sins. Why have the Ten Commandments if dare we hope is true? Pope St. Clement I wrote in his second epistle, if we neglect his commandments, nothing will rescue us from eternal punishment. The thesis is contrary to Jesus' teachings, scripture, and Mother Mary. According to CatholicTradition.org, Our Lady Fatima was a miracle witnessed by three children in a small Portugal village in 1917. The Virgin Mary appeared to the kids multiple times and told them secrets which were later revealed by the church. The first was image of souls falling into hell like snowflakes because there was no one to pray for them. The National Catholic Register says Mary commanded prayer for the souls and to lead all souls to heaven in most need of my mercy. The prayer is now known as the Fatima prayer. In Matthew 25, Christ literally says he will separate those whom are saved and those whom are not saved with the metaphor of a shepherd dividing out the goats from the sheep. So, is Frank going to be saved? Do you feel anything for, for, what, for what you've done? We don't officially know, but we do know is that he's finally trying. Uh, Father. Yep. Could, uh, do me a favor. Mm -hmm. Don't shut the door all the way. I don't like that. Just leave it open a little bit. Oh, okay. Frank's request for having the door open slightly has nothing to do with sleeping with one eye open. It originally started with Jimmy. Jimmy loved Frank and trusted him. He kept the door open out of an act of love, not fear. My door is always open, is what he's saying. Frank is thinking that there's a chance he's forgiven by God, that he can get into the doors of heaven. But if you ask me, I think it might be a little too late. <laughs> Thank you for watching another episode of Cinema Series. I'm your host, Matthew. You can follow me on social media at Michael Man Man on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you want to look at some cat photos, share some memes, or talk about movies, you can support this channel for free. You can click the like button. Doesn't really hurt to click a button. Neither does clicking the subscribe button. For some reason, people just watch these vids and they're just not subscribed, which is odd. I subscribe to people when I want to watch them and see their stuff. But uh, if you want to support this channel, you can do it fiscally as well. There's a t-shirt shop down below some scrolling items. I believe it's uh, right now it's a Red Wings at this time and, and <laughs> at this video release. There's some Red Wings designs and little scroll features. There's also a total of 16 designs in the t-shirt shop. I don't know of any other YouTuber that has 16 designs. Some are sports, some are movies, some are dinosaurs. There's a Terminator Los Angeles design I made that's pretty cool. And uh, pretty much most of them are Detroit, Edmonton, or LA sports. But they're really cool designs. I think that's something that's reflective of me. And you want to support me because I only make maybe like two bucks off of a video like this, unfortunately. There's also a tip jar. Only a few people have donated to the tip jar. But it's, it's a thing. You don't have to. There's also an Amazon store. You can buy equipment I use like this microphone. I got, you know, this mix board. Or recommendations like books and movies and stuff. So... The most important thing I always ask at the end of these videos is that you share the video with a friend. That's very important. Uh, if they like Marty Scorsese like I do, or if they like The Irishman. I love The Irishman. I think it's pretty much near a flawless film. It's in my top 10. It's actually in my top 4 uh, Scorsese films. And it's in my top 10 of the year for 2019. Uh, masterful, masterful filmmaking. Absolutely loved it. And uh, I hope you loved it. I hope you loved this video. Thanks again for watching. I hope you have a wonderful Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, whatever you celebrate. God bless. Thank you for watching. Have fun with your family. Peace. End of line. Good luck and congratulations on choosing Congress. Great to have the American ambassador expelled after the incident. The U.S. State Department responded quickly with a formal apology and announced.
announcement of the ambassador of the media is voluntary.